Brian Van Norden, it's good to talk to you. Thanks. It's good to be here. So I want to welcome uh, everybody in the Sophia audience. Um, uh, I'm Daniel Kaufman, of course, uh, professor of philosophy of Missouri State, host of the Sophia program at Meaning of Life TV on bloggingheads.tv. And I'm here with Dr. Brian Van Norden. And do you want to uh, give a little uh, brief bio on yourself so that people can know a little bit about you before we start? Uh, sure. I'm currently Kwan Im Thung Hood Cho Temple Professor at Yale NUS College in Singapore, um, but I'm also a professor in the philosophy department and the Department of Chinese and Japanese at Vassar College in the USA. And currently, I'm talking to you from uh, New York State, where I'm back for the holidays. So you're a double department head? Well, I'm uh, head of studies at the, the philosophy faculty at Yale NUS. I've previously been a chair of the philosophy department and I've been chair of the Department of Chinese and Japanese at Vassar College. But right now I'm just head of studies at uh, philosophy at Yale NUS. But I have a position at both Vassar and at Yale NUS. What I meant was when you were at Vassar, you had two department head spots? Well, uh, not at the same time, fortunately. Okay, okay. That would be insane. <laughs> well, I've been a department and I was about to just say you are a man of absolutely Herculean strength. Or, <laughs> yeah, it was bad enough being chair of the departments in series. That was hard enough. <laughs> um, now, that's an awfully interesting, uh, you know, a, a lot of our viewers, there's so much academia in this, this, this show that a lot of our viewers are, you know, interested. I'm just interested if you could talk for a minute or two how did you put together all those different affiliations? Is there a story there or? Um... Well, uh, when I got out of graduate school in, let me see, what was it, 1991, I think, um, I bounced around trying to find a tenure track position. Uh, eventually I was hired by Vassar College and I've been there for 22 years. And then more recently, uh, Yale and US uh, offered to make me the Kwan Im Thung Hood Cho Temple professor there. So I took a two year leave of absence from Vassar, and I'm currently at Yale and US, and there's a chance I might stay there indefinitely. Um, but I still have currently my position at Vassar. In a year or so, I'm going to have to make a decision about you know, do I want to stay at Vassar or do I want to stay at Yale and US? Right. For me now, I'm just fortunate enough to have two different institutions that I can say I'm affiliated with. Gotcha, gotcha. So the occasion, um, what, brought us, what brought us together uh, was that one of the Blogging Heads producers actually suggest, uh, suggested that, um, that uh, I talk with you um, on the basis of an article, an essay that you published not long ago in uh, Aeon, mm -hmm. um, on the, um, to put it, the title's a little clickbaity, um, um, but it's basically about the absence of non Western philosophy in most Western philosophy programs. Am I, is that a fair yeah, characterization of the thesis? It's about that fact and also a diagnosis of some of what happened that led to that state of affairs. Right. And so, you know, depending on how. How you understand this, how you mean this, I mean, I might want to push on some of that a little bit, but um, maybe before, and there'll be a link to the, to the Aeon piece so that people can read the whole essay. I will be, when I, as I talk to you, I've made a, a selection of excerpts from the piece that I want to ask you about and maybe elicit discussion. But first, before we get to the discussion itself, maybe you could talk about the book that the piece is excerpted from, because A, we'd like to share it with the audience. Um, so we want to hold it up. Yeah, I've got it right. <laughs> um, so it's called Taking Back Philosophy. Um, and is this a multicultural manifesto? That's the subtitle, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And um, uh, how long has this been out? It just came out this month, and now it's available uh, either directly from Columbia University Press. It's also available from Amazon.com. Um, so I encourage people to check it out. It's it, the, the, based on the ion piece. Uh, if, if it's anything, it's, it's gotta be interesting and very well written. Um, could you talk maybe about beyond what's in the ion? Piece? What does the book do beyond what's in the Aeon piece? Well, I'd like to think it's a very readable book. And when the occasion for writing it was in uh, 2016, uh, Jay Garfield of Smith college college and I, 
published an editorial in the New York Times called um, uh, "If Philosophy Departments uh, You Know Won't uh, Diversify, Let's Call Them What They Really Are." And in this editorial, we called on philosophy departments that don't teach any of Chinese, Indian, African, or Indigenous American philosophy to relabel themselves departments of Anglo-European philosophy to be honest about what it is they actually cover. And that was partially a tongue-in-cheek suggestion. As we said in the op-ed, we really wanted we'd prefer for people to broaden what they teach in U.S. philosophy departments. But we said, look, if you're not going to do it, just be honest about how narrow your coverage is. And to our surprise, the op-ed got a huge amount of attention. Um, it, I think we had about 800 comments on the website at the New York Times before they closed comments 12 hours later, over 20 different websites hosted discussions or had responses, either positive or negative. Um, a lot of it was very, very negative, extremely negative responses. And so my editor at Columbia University Press, Wendy Lochner, invited me to do a book based on it. And she said, I always remember, she said, write something cheap to something that will kind of get people excited about the topic. So the book's, uh, I think, very readable. The first chapter is called A Manifesto for Multicultural Philosophy. And it surveys how narrow the coverage of non-Anglo-European philosophy is among U.S. philosophy departments. It talks about some of the historical reasons for this change. And the piece in Eon is excerpted and slightly modified from that chapter. And then I also, in that chapter, provide some suggestions about where we should go from here, what some tactics are that we should use to broaden the coverage of the study of philosophy in the U.S., and I answer some of the common objections to, to doing so. So the, the, piece is pretty rep the piece is pretty representative then. It's, it's not like one chapter out of a book that you know, is on one topic, but the book covers four or five other topics. It's really a decent extraction of some of the main theses of the of the book and main the main it, point it is but the other chapters pursue some of the things that would naturally come up as you're thinking about that thesis so for example the second chapter i give examples of how you can bring non-western and western philosophy into a productive dialogue okay that's that um, seems very useful yeah yeah yeah, yeah. how you could do this and so yeah. I, saw, I bring confucians into dialogue with thomas hobbes buddhist uh metaphysicians on the nature of the self into dialogue with descartes so that's the second chapter yeah yeah, yeah. the third chapter is about the broader political implications of multiculturalism and i argue that the effort to build walls in politics between races, religions, and nations is related psychologically to the desire to build walls between different kinds of philosophies and distinguish us who are rational and moral from them who are non-rational or you know, uh, in, inadequately rational in comparison with us. And I talk about this both in the US and also in China where Xi Jinping is promoting Confucianism as a kind of tool of nationalism. The fourth chapter is devoted to responding to people who say, well, there's no point studying philosophy anyway. So the fourth chapter is entitled Welders and Philosophers, and it takes its title from a Senator Marco Rubio's notorious comment that, you know, we need uh, fewer, uh, less, well, less, less philosophers and more welders. And I look at why philosophy is good, both as vocational training, the contributions it's made to civilization, and also why it's just very useful for promoting democratic values of discussion uh, over coercion. And then the final chapter is a, is a call on philosophers to return to the roots of philosophy in issues that make a difference to people's ordinary lives and to write in a way that's accessible to the broader intellectual public, as opposed to just writing for other philosophers in a very uh, technical vocabulary. So okay, so th there's, a, there's a decent amount. So it sounds to me, though, that like there's quite a bit there yeah. that isn't particularly about the multiculturalism problem. In other words, it sounds to me almost like you're ta tackling some of the territory that, say, a Bob Frodeman has been has been have been hammering on, and that is the excessive disciplinary quality of philosophy today. Uh, is that is that fair to say that the, the multi that this is a much broader critique of the way contemporary philosophy is being done beyond merely its monocultural 
Because this last stuff you're saying doesn't really have much to do with the multiculturalism. It has to do with the other aspects of... Yeah, it's, she, it's a wide-ranging book, but throughout the chapters, you'll find I keep coming back to this issue. So in the final chapter, uh, the title is uh, Confucius and Socrates. And so I use them as two examples of philosophers who spoke to all the educated people and tried to address issues that everybody can see the importance of. And I talk about Martin Luther King Jr.'s interest in Plato's Republic, which he said was his favorite book after the Bible. Um, I talk about how Admiral James Stockdale said that studying the philosophy of Epictetus helped him to survive being in a prisoner of war camp in the Vietnam War. Um, and so there's a, there's a lot of different ways in which we come back to this issue of multiculturalism. But you're right, it's a kind of broad critique of philosophy, but also a defense of philosophy against those who say that it's irrelevant or has been replaced by science. Yeah. Um, the last thing on just on the book as a whole before we get into the details. So it's on Columbia University Press. It is an academic book. Well, it's, it's or, or is it or is it meant for a mass? Is it meant for a mass audience? It's meant for a mass audience. And so that's that's the way I wrote it. And I had a good editor, a content editor who went through it and helped me with it. Um, I had my my spouse, who's not an academic, and my kids um, who are in college read it and give me feedback about how to make it more lively. So I think people will find it you know, very lively. Even in the preface, I even note that uh, I wouldn't necessarily adopt this tone, in fact, I wouldn't if I were writing for just other philosophers, because I am occasionally a little flip or a little sarcastic in a way that I wouldn't find constructive if I were only addressing philosophers. But I want people to read it and have a good time. And if they're outraged, well, great, let them read some more on this topic and get into it in a more serious way. But this will you know, bring up genuine issues in a way that's responsible, but also provocative. Okay. All right. So let's, um, no, so, so just for the audiences, for the clarity's sake, I have only read the piece in, 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 uh, Aeon. Um, I have not had time to read the book yet. Um, um, and I wanted to do this with you before well, close enough to the Aeon piece coming out and close enough to your book coming out that, that it has some promotional effect as well as, as well. And so, and so I, uh, I, I'm going to read the book, and maybe after I read the book, I want to talk to you again about it. <laughs> but the, the Aaron piece had so much in it. It seems mm. to me there was more than enough there to have a conversation. Sure. Um, and so, um, um, so let's let's start this way. I mean, I'm going to want to let me be clear on what your view is with regard to the racism angle. Um, right. Is it your view that? The way we got to the point we're at now, that is where, where there's very little by way of Asian, uh, non-Western philosophy in Western philosophy departments, that the way we got here is through the racism of certain major figures of philosophy that then was carried through in their influence, or are you claiming that contemporary philosophers in Western departments are racists, mm -hmm. and that's the reason why they're not... because. The former seems to me obviously true. The latter seems, I would almost say, equally obviously untrue. Mm -hmm. um, I'd want to argue it's untrue. Um, um, and so I want to be clear so that we don't have an argument about something that we don't disagree on. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I, I definitely mean the, uh, and I appreciate your teasing out these two different strands, I definitely mean the former, that right. the way we got here, you can do a clear historical analysis of how we got to the exclusion of non-Western philosophy from philosophy departments in terms of what were clearly racist trends in the history of European thought. And when I started my academic career, if you'd have asked me, well, is the reason that people aren't studying Indian philosophy or Chinese philosophy in U.S. philosophy departments that there's some kind of racism, either individual racism or some kind of systemic racism, I would have said, oh, of course not, absolutely not. You know, the, the vast majority of philosophers are politically progressive. Um, conservatives would say that that represents a kind of bias, but be that as it may, I would have said there's, there's no way that racism, current racism is an issue. It's just a matter of, of ignorance and kind of leftover inertia. But having done this kind of thing for 30 years, I'm really starting to feel like there is a kind of problem with a kind of uh, subconscious racism and a kind of a systemic racism. And let me explain what I mean. If I've had this kind of conversation repeatedly with, with colleagues at various institutions, uh, not, I should say, at Vassar, which has always been very supportive 
of my study of Chinese philosophy and not at Yale and U.S., which has a, a very multicultural curriculum. Yeah, I mean, I mean, if Vassar's racist, then I don't know what it, you know, then I don't know what is right. right? I mean, <laughs> yeah, it's like, yeah, that's kind of hard. To but, but, it, and so here, but here's the kind of conversation I'll have with people. Yeah. Go ahead. Like, well, you know, why don't you, you, if you, if you can't hire somebody because, you know, you don't have an opening right now, you don't have funds, why don't you consider when somebody retires hiring somebody in Indian philosophy or Chinese philosophy, or why don't you just learn a little bit about it and maybe just incorporate a little bit into your own classes? And the response I get is, oh, well, there is no philosophy in India or there is no philosophy in China. And I say, okay, well, which of the major Indian or Chinese philosophers you've read, which ones did you not find philosophical? And I kid you not, I very often get the response, oh, I haven't read any. You know, but it's all like fortune cookies and things. And if you're thinking I don't get that response, oh, I get it all the time. I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm certainly not going to uh, suggest that you're, that you're, that you're not telling the truth about that. I'm just yeah. a little laughing. Um, yeah, I'm yeah, laughing. Yeah. Um, um, is there, do you have, is there data in the book? I mean, I look, my nothing, my nothing unranked, no graduate program, middle of nowhere philosophy department teaches an Asian philosophy course. That's great. Um, um, and, you know, I just looked at a few websites, you know, I went, I went to, you know, I went to places the opposite of this. I went to some of the big shot places, you know, NYU, whatever. They teach Asian philosophy. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious, do you actually have data I, as to I, how I, many departments are not teaching Western philosophy, uh, yeah. not teaching Asian yeah. philosophy? Well, take, take a look at it this way. There are approximately 100 U.S. Ph.D. granting institution in philosophy in the U.S., about 100 in the U.S. that grant a doctorate in philosophy. Of those 100, nine have a specialist in the philosophy department who teaches Chinese philosophy. Of those 100, five have a specialist in Indian philosophy. My book says six, but in between the time the proofs went in on my book and right now, one department lost one. So we went from six to five just over the time in between the proofs in my book. Of uh, the hundred that offer a PhD in philosophy, two teach indigenous American philosophy. So the, the numbers kind of speak for themselves. And okay, but that's, but that's only PhD granting institutions. That's the vast minority of institutions that are teaching philosophy to college students across the country. As I constantly feel I have to point out to people at Lighter Reports and other places mm -hmm. who seem to think that PhD granting lighterific schools are the only ones there are, right? No, but um, those are the ones that produce the people who go on to teach at all the other schools and if those people don't know anything about Chinese or Indian or indigenous or African philosophy, then it's not going to be widely taught. But do you have data for U.S. universities and uh, colleges as a whole, not just Ph.D. granting institutions, but including places like mine, which is where most of the philosophy in the country is being taught? At, at your school? Most of at schools like mine, right. unranked, no right. PhD program, unusual, yes. public public institutions. If you ask anybody. And, yeah, no, I don't have an exact number for because you. Because we have we have it. We have Asia. What the? Where's the pipeline? Like, where are the people who? Where'd you get your degree from? CUNY Graduate Center. Okay, so that is one of the few places where they actually have somebody who teaches. That's one of the nine. Yeah. Where you can actually learn something about it. So that well, you know the the, the woman who teaches problem, but there's not a problem. The woman who teaches oh I'm not saying there's no problem. I just no. want to be clear on what it is. Right. The woman who teaches Asian for us is a PhD from the University of Oklahoma. Yeah, um, that's one of the other nine. That's one of the other nine. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so I, I know all the I'm people, glad. it turns out. Center where you've run into, you know, so that might be, like I said, it's like, well, gee, I bet a lot of places do. Well, yeah, you you happen to have a colleague who went to the University of Oklahoma, <laughs> one of the other nine. You got your degree from CUNY graduate there. This one is one of the nine places. <laughs> it turns out that I know all the people in America who do you Asian philosophy. Right, just well, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I guess there is a certain danger. I mean, I mean, look, here's a certain kind of reasoning that at least at the surface you can say kind of works, but in this case, I guess it maybe doesn't. I mean, I was going to say, look, if the top place, if a place like NYU has an Asianist, mm -hmm. right, and a place like mine does, mm -hmm. and these are exactly the opposite, I mean, you know, between mine and NYU is pretty much every kind of university there is in the country, right? Mm -hmm. um, 
then it can't be that scarce. But but what you're saying is the way it's placed is kind of haphazard, I guess. The, the, where it yeah, and 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 also as you know, I mean, you know, uh, I mean, you've made a. I mean, I know you're just giving that as an example argument, but that's a classic logical fallacy. I understand two, that, two yes. examples, therefore. Right, right. But when, when we're not doing, like, when we're speaking in ordinary language, right? I mean, I mean right. you know, there's, and you don't have the data, right? Right. I mean, one but way I, but might, I say it, I do have the hard yeah, data on yeah, where yeah. are people being trained yeah. to get yeah. PhDs. Yeah. And places people are being trained to get PhDs, nine institutions out of about 100 in the United States, somebody who teaches Chinese philosophy, yeah. Five okay. down from six of a few months ago in right. the philosophy two. Right. Industry. When you go beyond Chinese, it probably drops like this, right? I mean, I yeah. mean, Chinese is probably yeah. the most common alternative. Uh, that, Which that, is, the is, and if somebody who does Chinese philosophy, I've got to say that's bizarre because it's so easy to incorporate, say, Indian philosophy. Yeah. Because they're so interested in metaphysics and epistemology and, and philosophy. Yeah, and logic, right? I, I thought I remembered back when I was in the graduate center in the 90s that there was some interest among Western logicians in Indian logic. Is, am I misremembering or, or is there, there, there is, there's a little, but like I say, we've got yeah. five out of a hundred. Yeah. 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 Anybody okay. on the staff. Okay. M maybe we'll talk a little bit more about the current scene at the end when we get to maybe some of your suggestions, but yeah. for now let's get to some of the meat of this. That's that I found the most interesting. So one of the things you do is you point out, you know, I think that people have a general impression that, the further back you go, the more racist everyone gets, right? Uh -huh, yeah. um, actually, that's really not true. I mean, racism, uh -huh. as we understand it, to some degree, is 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 an is a 18th and 19th century uh, invention, right? Right. Um, 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 in your essay, and I'm assuming in the book you do more of this, you really do some interesting uh, discussion about the the influence, the cross cultural influences within philosophy in antiquity. Mm -hmm. all the way up through the Enlightenment. So maybe right. you could give us a sort of a, a crash tour mm -hmm. of some of the highlights of what you take to be some of the most significant historical crossovers where Western philosophers and, uh, and non-Western philosophers have cross-pollinated historically. Right. Well, so the, uh, I mean, as I, as I point out in the Eon piece and also in the first chapter of the book, the the majority view of European philosophers in, say, the, the 18th century, through most of the 18th century, if you'd ask them, where does philosophy start? They'd say, oh, philosophy started either in India or it started in Northern Africa. And then it migrated from one or the other or both of those places to ancient Greece. And so that's what the, the homeland of philosophy is, is India or Africa. Then when missionaries reported back about Confucianism, uh, when they started writing in Latin and they translated the Analects, the sayings of Confucius into Latin in 1687, they translated the sayings of Confucius as Confucius Sonorum Philosophus, which means Confucius the Chinese philosopher. And he was immediately recognized as a, a significant philosophical thinker in the West. Leibniz, uh, can't get much more mainstream philosophy than that, was deeply impressed with the moral philosophy he learned about from the Chinese. He thought that the I Ching, the classic of changes, anticipated the binary arithmetic, which he had developed independently, and which is now the basis of all computer systems. Uh, some people have suggested that there are some surprising similarities. I think the current view is it's, he didn't steal it, it's just interesting similarities between Leibniz's view of monads um, and the, the notion of the pattern in Neo-Confucian thinkers. But that's an interesting kind of similarity. Where, where, where in Leibniz is this? Where do you find – are these like in notebooks or are these in his main, main text? Where do you find his yeah, references to yeah. – I give some citations in the book, but there's actually now there's several anthologies and books about uh, – Franklin Perkins has a book, A Commerce of Light, which is a study of – uh, Leibniz writings on China, and and but also there are translations of just Leibniz writings on China, which were well known in his era. Uh, so you have to look in specific works, but they were works that were well known in his era. And so, like I say, Frank Perkins' book is very good on this. It's available from Amazon or in, in your local library, Commerce of Light. What about antiquity in the Middle Ages? I mean, the reason I ask is because. Mm -hmm. 
the Middle Ages, if you if you if you if you study it properly, you know there was trem- there was tremendous cross pollinization uh, of Islamic philosophers over uh, uh, with, with with Christian ones, and yeah. that's your bridge to the to the to the to the non West, right? That's your bridge right. to the East. So, right. well, how about in antiquity and then in the Middle Ages? Um, what sort of what sort of cross pollination uh, was there, and the, what, that you would deem significant was there? Yeah, it, I mean, it depends on what sources you believe. I mean, as, you, as I say, there have been... Well, you're the expert. What sources do you believe? Well, <laughs> um, well but these are, these are some areas that I'm, I'm not an expert in. So, for example, the relationship between how extensive was the relationship between Indian culture and uh, Greek culture around the time of the Pythagorean. Oh, I see. Some yeah, yeah. Have talked about... There's dispute about, over that. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah. The notion of reincarnation that we find in the Pythagoreans, was this something that was influenced by contact with Indian civilization? Or, you know, Plato talks about, you know, the wise people of uh, Greece, like Solon, going to Egypt to learn the secrets uh, of the Egyptian priests. Is that a typical kind of Platonic myth, like the story of Atlantis? Or is there some kernel of truth in that? These are the kind of things that, you know, I don't claim to be an expert right. in that. And then there's probably there's disagreement on that's not settleable, probably. Right. <laughs> and, there's, and there's not a, uh, a substantial influence of, say, Confucian or Taoist philosophy on ancient Western philosophy. So in that respect, there's not a... There's so not a I, I, I'm totally ignorant of this. So this, this is the, the wrong connection. Please say so. But I thought I remember people saying that there were some startling similarities between Confucianism and Aristotelian virtue ethics. Oh, there, there is. And in fact... Now, is that entirely of, accidental? Yeah, I think it's just great minds thinking alike. And okay. so in, in okay. both traditions, you and I, a lot of my own research is focused on this, and I'm, I'm not the first person to do this. Uh, but in both the Aristotelian tradition and the Confucian tradition, you find a concern with uh, the virtues, good traits of character, uh, a, a flourishing life, that is to say, the overall way of life as being in many ways the primary thing that you're focusing on to organize your other evaluations. How do you cultivate those virtues in an individual? And what must human nature be like such that the methods of cultivating, cultivation you're using are going to be effective? So I've said those four things are in common between the two traditions. We'll focus on a way of life, on the virtues that are conducive to that way of life, how do you cultivate those virtues, and then what must human nature be like so that you can cultivate those virtues. But you see no evidence of cross-pollination. You think that's just parallel development. I think it's just parallel development in that case, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so, um, so perhaps – in antiquity in the Middle Ages, there was cross-pollination. Certainly, you think, uh, and it's demonstrable, when you get to the Enlightenment, there was. Right. Um, um, now, I, I'll give you, since you asked, I'll give you yeah. an example that's more, more relevant. Yeah, give me some others. I mean, how about Spinoza? Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, again, that, that could be a, a case of great minds thinking in parallel. And so mm. you find monists in both... You find them in the Indian tradition, you find them in the Chinese tradition. Tradition Occasionally you find them in the West. But one of the things I point out in chapter two of my book is it's almost a dogma in the West that whatever exists is going to have to be individuals that in some way are, are fundamentally distinct, even if they share qualities. And so Aristotle, one of the greatest minds of the Western tradition, wrestles with this again and again. He takes a first stab at it in the categories, and then he returns to it in the metaphysics. And as I'm sure you know, you try to read the metaphysics, and he's a guy who just who's never, can't quite solve this problem of what is an individual. Well, he changed his mind. I mean, yeah, he changes in his the mind categories, he says that the individual is the most fundamental building block, but then in, the, in Metaphysics Zeta, he says it's form. He actually right. becomes more like Plato. Right, but, um, then, but then um, he still wants to find something yeah. just, substance it's somehow individual but it yeah. keeps slipping out of his hands yeah i think in both the indian tradition and the chinese tradition they'd say well your problem is assume you're going to find some kind of ultimately distinct individuals things are by their nature unified and so the the distinctions between things are to a greater or lesser degree an abstraction yeah so i think spinoza is unusual in having a comparatively monistic view in the in the west you do have examples parmenides spinoza uh, like the neo-Hegelians like Bradley, but they tend to be more the exception. So yeah. but a, a more significant influence is the, the notion of laissez-faire economics, 
uh, Francois Quesnay, who's one of the, the founders of this trend in the West, he was called uh, the Confucius of Europe by his contemporaries hmm. because he was so enamored of Chinese thought. And he found in the Confucian and Taoist notion of Uwe, non-action, a model for uh, the ideal social arrangement in which you allow things to be what they are naturally without artificially interfering in them. And this uh, influence has continued to the present day where Ronald Reagan actually quoted the Tao Te Ching in a State of the Union address. Did he know he was quoting the Tao Te Ching? <laughs> he actually did. He quoted it by name. I cite it in the book and he actually refers to it. I mean, it's a speech writer. But, right, yeah. right, right, right. It's a literate speechwriter, yes. um, um, and and just for the sake of, for the audience, um, the reason you're talking exclusively about Asian influences is because that's the area you know. Right? Exactly. Um, um, exactly. Um, 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 would you say though? I mean, from what you know, just from your from doing this work, and I'm assuming you know you sort of found things out in a tertiary sort of way. Right. Would you say that the greatest non the greatest non Western cross-pollinator was Chinese, or would you say that there are others that were as uh, significant? Uh, I'm not sure. I mean, in a way, the book isn't so much about cross-pollination. It's about the, the value of having a dialogue now. So even right, and that's that's the forward-looking part. But yeah. I mean, I'm, I I did find the history rather interesting, yeah, yeah. probably because I didn't know some of it. Right, um, right. And I suspect so, a lot of people don't. Yeah, and um, and I, there is. I mean, as you know, since you ask about it, I mean, there's also a way in which, for people in the Enlightenment, Confucius became a real symbol of rationalism, because rightly or wrongly, the lesson people learned from Jesuit reports was, here's a country that has a moral system based on natural reason, not on faith in God. And so, as I, I cite the famous case of Christian Wolff, who's not as well known among philosophers like, say, Leibniz or Spinoza today, but in his era was a very, very influential philosopher. And as I point out in the book, he lost his job because he gave a public lecture in which he said that Confucius showed us that we could separate belief in God from morality. We could have a morality that doesn't have a, a requirement for belief in God. And so he was... Uh, forced out of his position by conservative Christians in his era, he bounced into an even better position at another university, and then a year or so later gave another talk in which he praised uh, Chinese thinkers for taking the advice of, so he praised Chinese thinkers for the fact that their government leaders took the advice of philosophers, his term, like Confucius and Mengzi and draws the implication that in the West, we should take philosophers seriously the way they take their philosophers seriously. Last thing on this historical stuff. Um, so how would some of these people have been getting this stuff? I mean, I'm presuming that Leibniz did not read Chinese. So he's reading translations. Right. Who's producing translations of Chinese philosophy in 18th century Europe? Largely the Jesuits. I mean, the Jesuits really, uh, when they went to China, they became enamored of Confucianism very quickly. And in fact, there's a famous controversy, the rights controversy, where uh, since ancestor veneration is an important part of Chinese ritual practice, the issue developed whether or not you could be a good Christian and also do rituals to venerate your ancestors. And the Jesuits in China said, this is a, a kind of civic uh, practice. It's, it's not idolatry. You know, they're just, you know, praying to their departed ancestors, not worshiping them the way you might pray to a saint. And they were overruled by the Vatican, which really, and sa who said that, no, you can't do those kinds of things if you're going to be a good Christian. But the Jesuits really admired Confucianism, and they translated things like the sayings of Confucius into English. And then later, uh, Protestant missionaries did it. The first translation I read of the great Confucian Mengzi, or Mencius, was by James Legg, who's a Presbyterian missionary in China in the late 19th century. And he just translated all the Confucian classics, all of them. And so a lot it's of the thing about it. it's funny the thing about ancestor worship. I, I'm surprised that Ro that Rome would have been uh, so opposed to it, considering that that was a, a 
a basic universal Roman practice. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. That's what all those, yeah. that's what all those Roman portrait busts are. Right. Yeah, um, well, um, they should have taken the advice <laughs> of the Jesuits. I think Christianity would have done better in China. Um, okay. So let's now talk again about the contemporary situation. Um, and, and, and your suggestion. So, um, the way we get to here, you say at least one major way that we get to here is through Kant and right. that Kant was a notorious uh, racist, which is uh, true. Obviously right. he was also notoriously weird and horrible in other ways. I mean, he was upset. Yeah. He obsessed about masturbation. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I, you know, in other words, in other words, um, there is a way to, to truthfully make all of the greatest, thinkers in the history of philosophy look ridiculous, right? I mean, and I want to avoid sort of doing that in a, in a, in a simple, in a simplistic or, or right. a casual way. Um, so trying to avoid that sort of thing, I presumably Kant wasn't the only racist. No, no, <laughs> absolutely around. not. And so what is it specifically, is there something specific to Kant that's so important that you think represents yeah. an, an intellectual pivot in this regard down the road of sort of cleansing Western philosophy of any a, uh, Eastern or non-Western influences. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm deeply influenced here by the work of Peter K.J. Park, who's written a terrific book, Africa, Asia, and the History of Philosophy. And he's done the actual legwork of going back and reading history of philosophy textbooks that were in common use in the 18th century and after. And what he argues, he said, what you find is as I've been suggesting, prior to the time of Kant, people were pretty open-minded about philosophy in India and, and China, at least. And then with Kant, because Kant is such a great philosopher, and I, I would I still teach Kant, I would always continue to teach Well, you have to. You really can't not teach him. I mean... Yeah, yeah. and I think he's just deeply insightful about a lot of things. I mean, yeah. I'm Kantian in my epistemology, broadly speaking. So... Uh, and you have to take seriously his, his work on, on ethics. It's a great resource for whatever your political position is if you take freedom seriously. But his, he became so dominant that the Kantians rewrote the history of philosophy in a way to make it appear that all of earlier philosophy was groping more or less successfully toward critical idealism. Now, this is interesting to me. So, yeah. you, and I, this was something I'm not aware of, despite the fact that I, I pride myself on being relatively well-educated in history of ideas. Yes. So, Kant was not just viewed as a synthesis, a synthesis of the Cartesian and the Humean strains of philosophy. You're, you're saying that at the time, he was being spoken of as a culmination of philosophy, what, since the pre-Socratics? Exactly. Yeah, and so they, they kind of... Well, that seems wildly <laughs> overblown. <laughs> oh, it is. It is. It is. But, you know, this is... I mean, you think about... I mean, you and I know this. I mean, you think about intellectual movements when... Uh, and we see... I mean, Thomas Kuhn has pointed out similar things in the history of science. When a new movement comes in, and part of the reason a new movement becomes successful is it's got to kill its ancestors or its competitors. And so when analytic philosophy comes in, uh, you know, Moore and Russell, it's got to be like, well, we think we've got a better idea than McTaggart or Bradley. It's like, no, McTaggart and Bradley are buffoons. <laughs> Nothing made any sense. I mean, even if you read Russell's history of Western philosophy, which I read in high school, basically he just makes fun of everybody who yeah. doesn't have a view that's gradually developing towards Russell's own version of kind of semi-platonized yeah. empiricism. It's, it's a great book by Russell. It's a terrible history of philosophy. Exactly. Right? <laughs> yeah. it's, a great, it's a nice, it's a kind of polemical history yeah. where you rewrite the yeah. history to make it look like, well, everything good has been building towards us. And Park argues, I think convincingly, this is what happened. So you're right. If it had just been, like say Hume is also very racist. Um, but, you know, they didn't rewrite the history of philosophy in Hume's lifetime to make it look like everything was building up to Hume. Right, right. Um, so, so who who was doing? I mean, so was this the sort of the the post Kantian people who were doing this? Um, in, yeah, Kant's uh, you know uh, immediate followers, and then in the following generation, they kind of rewrote philosophy. In you this. mean like Fichte and 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 
and some of the other post content? Like, like I say, look at uh, Peter K.J. Park's yeah. book yeah. for all yeah. the details about you know who wrote what, because he goes right. through gives you excerpts from a bunch of different histories and shows you who's on what side. Now, the Indian side is, is I know less about, but my colleague Vishwa Adluri um, and uh, Joy uh, Bagchi have a book, uh, The Nay Science, N-A-Y, uh, a pun on Nietzsche's The Gay Science, where they talk about the, the way in which the German Indology gradually started out by taking Indian philosophy seriously as philosophy and then gradually uh, museumified it and philologized it as something that was merely a philological um, and intellectual history interest and not interesting as philosophical work. And so they tell the story about how these things happened in the case of Indian philosophy. And people like Hegel are a big influence here because Hegel, uh, leading up to Hegel, many people were very interested in Indian philosophy as philosophy in the Bhagavad Gita. But Hegel said, no, this stuff is not, this isn't serious philosophy. Oh, Hegel actually specifically spoke of the, the, the Indian philosophy itself, specifically. Oh, yeah. And yeah, dismissed yeah, and dismissed it explicitly, and this was a major factor in squelching the 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 bud the bird the developing interest uh, in Indian philosophy in Germany. And gradually, I mean, it's an interesting kind of book, the Nay Science by uh, Ed Lurie and uh, Bach, for the other guy, I know it was a Bob Cheap, I think, uh, uh, recounts this history. But yeah, Hegel was a major figure in making sure that Indian philosophy was not taken seriously as philosophy. He didn't like Chinese philosophy either, by the way. And what about, so I'm, I'm not going to ask you about, you know, what about this guy? What about that? But there are two I want to ask about, and that's Nietzsche and Schopenhauer. Mm, right. So Schopenhauer actually, yeah, you've got a lot of admiration there. For, I would think so. I mean, yeah, I mean yeah. and it's, and it's sincere. And he's very influential Schopenhauer. So, yeah. so is, does that represent a sort of a, 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 a pushback against this very racist sort of trend or, or do you think not enough? <laughs> not, not enough. Not I, mean, enough. Because what, I mean, this is something where I, I think what happens is people say, Oh, that's kind of nice. He shows how open-minded he is that he read this stuff, but really what we care about is Schopenhauer. And so it could have led in a different direction. People might've said, Oh, let's go back to the original sources and learn about these East Asian philosophers who influenced Schopenhauer. But that generally wasn't the way it went. It was more like, Oh, Schopenhauer is this interesting alternative to a kind of Hegelian approach and also a way of reading a kind of post-Kantian tradition. And so they, they focused on that aspect of his thought, which is interesting. And, and didn't give enough credit to how much of it might have been influenced by non right. sort. And what about Nietzsche, just quickly? Uh, you know? I, mean, well, uh, I mean, again, I think, uh, I mean, Nietzsche tends to portray uh, Asian philosophy as, as not life-affirming. Oh, he and, does. He does. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and so okay. and so that's uh, it's it's part of this anti-life affirming trend he thinks that we see also in Christianity. Okay, so okay. He's not going to to tend to find uh, in Nietzsche. There are contemporary Nietzscheans who have found interesting what they. Claim I just could see an affinity. I don't know why. I mean, because Nietzsche was so. Nietzsche is not going to be his his. his his racism or xenophobia is not going to be informed by a kind of a Christian centered, right? right. Um, um, and, and he, and he, and he was, a f and he was in favor of re elevating the Dionysian tradition over the Apollonian. And so I just wondered whether he yeah, might not be a bit more open to, uh, yeah, but he just kind of buys, buys into the kind of stock stereotype of, you know, well, these, you know, people are just these rigid, very self-controlled. Um, so he doesn't right. find a Dionysian element. Right. Right. The Indian right. Or the, right. The Confucian tradition. Okay, so this gets then filtered. So, so, so because Kant is so hugely influential, and, and you can see the history of philosophy after Kant mm -hmm. as being largely defined by the reactions to him, right? And right. so you get that's where you get the analytic and continental traditions from, right? Is yeah. by divergent rea responses to Kant. Right. And so it's plausible to say, as, as you do, that because, in a sense, Kant so it was so emphatically uh, anti non-Western philosophy mm -hmm. and that the whole history of philosophy was reconceived to look like Kant was the culmination of wow. everything from the pre-Socratics on um, that that then would filter forward. Right. In both the analytic and Kant. Now, is there any, is, 
for some reason, it would seem to me that the Continentals would be more amenable. Um, is, is that not the case? I, I haven't found it to be the case. So, uh, I mean, it's like anything, it's complicated. Heidegger, earlier in his career, well, I could say in the middle of his career, um, after being in time, uh, he kind of had a dalliance with Chinese philosophy, and he started to work on a translation of the Tao Te Ching with a Chinese colleague. And the Chinese colleague eventually kind of backed off because he said, well, this isn't really a translation. This is Heidegger kind of appropriating the text for his own views. Uh, but later in his career, Heidegger said, and this is an almost exact quotation, he said, the phrase Western European philosophy is a tautology. Because he said it's only in, in philosophy, it's only in Greece that philosophy could have developed. And then Derrida, when he was visiting China, hosted by Chinese philosophy departments, said there is no philosophy in China, only thought. Yeah, you quoted that. You quoted that in the in the ambi. Yeah. I found that I found that astonishing. Um, it is. Um, and and I, I also, but on the other hand, there's plenty of blame to spread around. And so you know, G.E. Moore uh, was at a meeting of the Aristotelian Society, and an Indian philosopher was talking about uh, Vedanta. And uh, Moore said, uh, well, I don't really know anything about this topic, but I know that whatever he, this man has to say is wrong. <laughs> and that's, I'm sure that's partially in the spirit of, you know, just joking among academics. But when you're talking in a context in which the validity of what this person is doing is a question, that kind of joke has a silencing effect. And so it, it reinforces people's sense that, yeah, this is something we can laugh at. It's not something we need to take really seriously. We know it's just kind of a joke. Yeah, I mean, more, more is a little tricky just simply because, on the one hand, quite brilliant in some ways and very influential, but on the other hand, tremendously obtuse. I mean, I mean, yeah. just sort of, you know, and laughable sorts of mistakes. Yeah. Um, 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 even in works that are great, like the Principia Ethica, I mean, this is a, it's just a, disastrous laughable mistake at the very beginning right about the whole naturalistic <laughs> fallacy right? right um so i you know i w i wouldn't I, he could be quite foolish right i mean i i would be right. i would want not want to use him as a, as a chief example i guess i i guess what i'm wondering is well maybe it is worth talking about the current day so here here's right. the problem i have and 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 I think I know what you're going to say. The answer is, but I want to voice it because I'm sure other people will be thinking it also. I mean, you can't get much more liberal than left wing than philosophy professors, right? I mean, I mean, if you look at the current sorts of obsessions, they're all social justice, identity politics. I mean, you can't be a pure enough trans activist, right? I mean, you can't. I mean, this poor Rebecca Tuvel was hounded to death by the editors of Hypatia, which is hardly a collection of conservatives, right? I mean, and so I guess th this raises some sort of interesting questions. I mean, one question that might raise is, how could it be that people this left wing mm -hmm. could nonetheless be racist, could, but nonetheless be racist? But it also raises another sort of interesting question, that is, um, maybe a lot of left wing people are racist. Maybe, maybe, maybe this is one... Uh, insult that the left hurls against the right that that really is the the pot calling the kettle black i mean maybe there's an element of that to it also it's just hard to me imagine that the same people who are you know voting for jill stein mm -hmm. and and going on and on about you know tr trans identity and, and purging people who aren't pure enough on in their leftism are all of a sudden a bunch of racist and think that chinese philosophy is just a bunch of you know uh, ding dong dial stuff. I mean, right. You know, it's hard to sort of put that together and maybe you could talk a little bit about how you see that congruence. Well, I, I, I mean, I think the, uh, one of the, I'm a big fan of Aristotle, but one of the things that I think he's wrong about, I mean, he has a nuanced view about it, but, uh, there isn't a unity of the virtues. So humans are complex creatures and sometimes we have, uh, very well-developed, some virtues and not well-developed other virtues or aspects of a virtue. So a virtue will function exceptionally well in some areas, not in others. So to pick one obvious example, uh, you know, if you'd asked me, you know, just a, a few weeks ago to say, well, who's one of your favorite contemporary politicians? I would have said, oh, Al Franken. Oh, he's the best. <laughs> oh, I mean, everything he says is just okay with me. Everything he does is okay with me. Except for this. Uh, <laughs> <right>? except, <laughs> except, <laughs> 
and uh, and they say, well, how is that? I, I mean, so do we then say? Uh, I mean, we wouldn't say like, oh well, so that can't have been inappropriate what he did because he's such a strong advocate for women's rights and feminism in so many other areas. We say, no, people are complicated and sometimes they have vices that exist side by side with virtues and we can't be afraid to call that out. And so I think it's the same thing here. I mean, people who uh, are rightfully horrified by say the, the disproportionate number a uh, percentage of African Americans who are shot by police um, as a as a percentage of the population, uh, or who are horrified by the considerably higher death rates among African American mothers than among uh, white mothers. Uh, those same people, if you say, "Well, why aren't you thinking about teaching some Chinese philosophy?" They, they feel like they can just dismiss it by saying, well, it's not philosophy, and no, I haven't read any. I don't need to read any. I just know it's not. I mean, here's, here's some more data since we're talking about data. This comes from uh, Maisha Cherry and Eric Spitzgable. They did some research, and they pointed out that 62% of uh, the U.S. population is non-Hispanic white, but 86% of philosophy PhDs are non-Hispanic white. And this, you might say, well, okay, we're in a transitional period. There's, you know, we're trying to get over racism. But philosophy is unusually bad in this respect. So philosophy has a much more disproportionately white group of PhDs than other fields in the humanities. Likewise, 13% of the U.S. population is African-American. 2% of philosophy PhDs are African-American. Uh, now, about 5 million Americans claim some indigenous American ancestry. 20 philosophy PhDs, not 20%, 20 individuals with philosophy PhDs in the U.S. claim indigenous American heritage out of the approximately 5 million in the U.S. who claim that identity. Yeah, but I don't need to tell you that it's, I don't need to tell you that it's, but I don't need to tell you that it's dangerous to draw inferences um, as to bigoted intent from those kinds of general statistics. I mean, if you look at the number of men in nursing, it's very low, but it's not as if that's because the nursing programs are, are anti-male and are discriminating against men. I mean, mm -hmm. in, other, in, in other words, that by alone doesn't impress me very much. Um, well, actually, I mean, the, the nursing case is a case in point, because why aren't more men going into nursing? It's a great career. You can make a lot of money. Uh, it's, it's a very mobile career. You can work anywhere in the United States with a degree in nursing. Well, because of sexism. It's like, oh, you're, you're a guy and you're a nurse? I, I don't get it. Why aren't but you, you don't, but I, What I'm saying is that you don't know that. I mean, that's an inference that you're drawing. Well, from, everything is, it's the fact that I'm talking to a human being now is an inference. I, I understand that, but, but I, let's just say I'm quite skeptical of those kinds of inferences from general population statistics. It just assumes mm -hmm. that everyone has the same interests, and the reason why things are distributed differently only could be because of some pernicious – uh, 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 intention on the part of it. And I just don't think that that's true. Um, well, why, why do you think so few? I have no idea, but I'm, I'm not going to ascribe bad well, motives. I got, I got an explanation. So if you have a phenomenon and you've got an explanation, <laughs> which on the face of it is at least prima facie plausible, doesn't have to be right, but it's a plausible explanation. And you say, well, the alternative is no explanation. Guess what? The explanation that is plausible then wins. Then no, well, wins what? It's not a game. I mean, it, it's, it's plausible. Look, it's plausible. I don't know. I, I'm. I'm often. Let's put it this way. I often think the better, the better, the better thing to do is to say you don't know. <laughs> um, um, that doesn't mean that there isn't an answer. It just means that you don't know what it is. And well, so, so let's combine two data points. Then, so on the one hand, we have this fact that you've got only nine out of a hundred PhD programs teach Chinese philosophy. Five out of a hundred teach Indian. Two out of a hundred teach Indigenous. Uh, I've been trying to get good statistics on how many teach African or African-American philosophy. I've, I've had trouble getting good statistics on it, but have trouble believing it's a lot huger than these. But, but, you know, but just so these small numbers teach Chinese, Indian, or indigenous American philosophy. And the, the field is overwhelmingly non-Hispanic white. And you're going to tell me, well, maybe this is all just a coincidence. Yeah, 
Just yeah, saying. or or due to factors that are coextensive that you're not paying that you're not attending. I mean, look. So here's the way that something like this can happen, right? It can start off a certain way, but then it gets into a track that then is in a sense self reinforcing without there having to be conscious intent. In other words, look, you take the initial Kantian racist sort of reconfigure reconceptualization, right? Mm -hmm. You let that go on for a little while. Then you get to the continental analytic split. Then you get to the naturalistic and linguistic turn and, and, and the scientism in analytic philosophy. And now you have a way to self-perpetuate this kind of very narrow focus without anybody walking around saying, I'm not going to have any of the damn Indian philosophy around here, right? I mean, okay, but, then, but then when you go to these people who've made the linguistic and the logical turn and you say, you know what, there's this really interesting tradition of philosophy of language and logic in the Indian tradition. They say, yeah, no, there, there's not philosophy in India. Or, or I, I don't know what, what right, would but, I, but what we would don't I, have, we don't have books on this topic. Uh, right. No, I, I don't have time to read. But that. that's anecdotal, right? We don't have systematic social science data as to the attitudes of philosophers towards Indian philosophy, do we? Well, let, let me, let me give you another example. So, uh, so for one thing, um, Justice Antonin Scalia, in the uh, majority, in the my, a dissenting opinion in Obergefell v. Hodges, the Supreme Court decision that legalized gay marriage, Kennedy cited Confucius in the majority uh, opinion on the centrality of marriage to the human condition. Scalia complained and said that the majority position has reduced the uh, the prestige of the Supreme Court to the mystical aphorisms of the fortune cookie. Right. That's, a, that's a Scalia. US Supreme Court. That's saying, Scalia, who's one of the most right-wing jurists we've ever had. Yeah, not, and, I suspect no, philosophy professors are not fans of Antonin Scalia. And, okay, here's another example. <laughs> um, Eugene Park, not Peter Park, but Eugene Park was a graduate student in a top U.S. philosophy department. And I, I know which one it was, but I won't, uh, I won't let that out because I learned that as a secret. But I, I can guarantee it's a top U.S. philosophy department, and I, can, my, I cite the article in, in my book. And he uh, said, while he was a, a Ph.D. student, why can't we do more philosophy like philosophy of race or philosophy outside the mainstream canon? And he said that typical comment he was given by one of his instructors was, this is the tradition we work in, uh, study it or leave. That's what he was told. And then when he tried to incorporate some non-Western philosophy into his dissertation, all he wanted to do was incorporate some into his dissertation. His dissertation advisor said, why don't you translate, why don't you transfer to religious studies or some other department where ethnic studies is more welcome? Yeah, but you're surely not suggesting that the contemporary philosophy establishment is not interested in philosophy of race and philosophy of gender and all. I mean, this seems to Actually, be all they this seems to be all they're interested in, right? I mean, look at what the what? APA is funding. Look at what look at the research grants that the APA is funding. Mm -hmm. Every single one of them virtually has to do with some element of social justice. I mean, a survey was done of uh, what philosophy departments think is most important to have. The two bottom topics were philosophy of race and non-Western philosophy. Mm -hmm. So you so, so you th and so the AP so the APA then is not representative of philosophy departments you don't think that's I mean that's a it's a there are some movements that I think are very positive in the APA and so I think that people are trying to change things from the top down but no that's not representative of what most people in the APA think again I can give you example yeah. after example yeah. after example yeah. like this of how, what do people actually encounter when you try to get them to study. Chinese or other kinds of non-Western philosophy. This is the kind of responses you get. You might say, well, Scalia is really right wing. He's just saying what a lot of other people, you know, think, or they whisper to other people at the faculty club. Yeah. And then you see that when you're a graduate student and you say, hey, maybe I could include some Confucianism in my thesis, transfer out. This isn't ethnic studies. This is philosophy. Um, so let's talk about uh, your suggestions. So, um, um, is it, there certainly is at least a very visible social justice movement within professional philosophy. Sure. Um, 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 you know, something like this Hypatia fight over Rebecca Tuvel would not have been as high profile as it was if Hypatia was some, you know, 
off in the corner, obscure uh, operation, right? Yeah. Or if, if people like if people like the edit, people on the editorial board were no nobody, no name people. I mean, Jason, you know, people like Jason Stanley and John Jenkins in Chicago. These are not small people in contemporary philosophy. And so, is your idea, is your hope that to add this, this what you want to see happen, to add this to the current push on social justice topics within contemporary uh, within contemporary philosophy, or do you want to do it some other way? I, I would just like people to think about things like when someone retires, do you need to hire somebody who does Anglo-European philosophy, or could you hire somebody who at least has an AOC in some kind of non-Western philosophy, or to use a catch-all term I use in the book, one of the less commonly taught philosophies. So some philosophy is hard to classify. So things like Islamic philosophy, because Islamic philosophy is deeply indebted to the Greco-Roman tradition, but it, it doesn't get as much attention in the academy either. So, but if the department said, well, we thought about hiring somebody in Chinese philosophy, instead we're gonna hire somebody in Islamic philosophy, I'd say, well, hey, more power to you. I have no problem with that. Or if, uh, I'm asking people say, well, if you teach an intro level course, there are plenty of resources available to learn about non-Western philosophy. Why don't you just read a book or go to a website like The Deviant Philosopher um, that run by some colleagues of mine where they have lesson plans and guides about how you can incorporate anything from an entire semester course on non-Western philosophy to just one week or just one lesson on a figure from non-Anglo-European philosophy. That's all I want. Just a but, little bit more. Yeah, but but beyond you are imploring people to do this. I mean, um, um, I guess what I'm asking is: Are you suggesting or recommending any kind of institutional mechanisms mm -hmm. um, by which to uh, encourage this? I mean, do you want to go through the APA? Do you want to try and sort of, uh, or is it, or is it just you writing this book and you're yeah. trying to tell people I'm, you're not, you're not really interested you, in? Yeah, I mean, you're talking about the APA. I've tried to go through the APA. I, uh, I can send you a, a copy of a, this photo. I, it's, it's in one of the other articles I did where the APA organized a special session on learning about non Chinese philosophy for non-specialists. At the start of the meeting, there were about five people in the audience. And so I went, all, I went to the back of the room. I took a picture just to show how empty the room was. There were a couple other concurrent sessions. I went into those rooms packed. And so you give people a chance to learn about something like Chinese philosophy and you advertise it as you say, not for specialists, this is something to introduce it to non-specialists and you get five people who are already specialists in Chinese philosophy. Yeah, our Asian philosophy course is popular. Um, I, and, it's it part, and it's part of, it's part of several other degree programs like global studies and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And on top of it, so, so it's popular. It puts seats and chairs. And so, we've always hired so that we can keep that class staffed. Good. good. Um, um, you're, you're not standard. I gotta, I gotta tell you. And I say, if you just, you talk. Yeah. And I'm in, I'm in, I'm in the lower Midwest. I mean, I'm in the buckle of the Bible belt. I yeah. mean, if any, I mean, I mean, maybe one of the things that's coming out of this, you know, maybe this, the, the point I was saying before about liberals and conservatives and all this maybe is a bit strong, should be made a bit more strongly. It seems like you're saying this doesn't really quite slice politically the way you'd think. Right. Um, 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 if a place like mine mm -hmm. treats Asian philosophy as perfectly normal, and why would we not have this? It's popular and it's part of several made degree par You know, what's wrong with the people at the elite places who at least professedly are way more liberal exactly. than people in the Bible Belt, right? I mean, exactly. yeah. <laughs> um, and it used to be that, for example, uh, the Hoover Institution at Stanford, which is notoriously conservative, yeah. It actually published a lot of, historically speaking, I don't, know, I don't know any recent research, but historically speaking, they did some quite good research and archiving on Chinese communist thinkers because their attitude was, look, we're opposed to this, but we need to understand who we're arguing against. And yeah. it seems like that's something you should be able to get behind regardless of what your political orientation yeah. is. And the fact is, as I noted earlier, Xi Jinping is really pushing Confucianism as a way of giving the Han Chinese an identity as a people now that no one really takes very seriously Chinese communism except in name. Right. So this is something we need to learn about just for geopolitical purposes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I, you know, the more I'm listening to you and thinking about this, 
um, you know, I understand the reason for and the arguments behind and the evidence for the sort of the, the, the racialist, the racist element of this. But I'm also seeing another dimension of it um, um, that I think maybe today is actually the more efficacious element mm -hmm. and that maybe the way to accomplish what you want is maybe to come at it this way. And that is, it seems to me that one of the reasons why it might be the case that a school like mine's teaching Asian philosophy and a much higher ranked school and a much more liberal place is not, is partly because we are not juiced into the professional disciplinary in other words, in other words, philosophy and anal especially the analytic tradition became so technical, so bound to natural science um, that it kind of cultivated a kind of culture. It, 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 it pulled philosophy the farthest away from the humanities that it's probably ever been. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's unrec the philosophy of Montaigne is unrecognizable. Right. As philosophy, you could easily I could easily get a professor to tell me Montaigne is not philosophy as yeah. to tell me that some Chinese philosopher is not philosophy. True. True. And so what I wonder is whether at this point, because the people in the discipline are so liberal and progressive, that what's really holding us back from doing what you want now are the disciplinary characteristics of philosophy, right? The fact that it's so juiced into this kind of power structure where you have the, 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 all the top people clustered together in a small number of institutions. They're the ones pumping out all the research that's going into the top journals. It's all technical. It's all narrow. It's all, I'm wondering if there's, in other words, I'm wondering if, if Bob Frodeman is a better avenue to getting what you want than the racism bell, right? Well, and, and in fitness, that's why, like I say, the chapters in the book actually kind of fit together because, like I said, the last chapter is, you know, the, the way of Socrates and Confucius and saying philosophy needs to learn to talk to people again. Yeah. Because yeah. anybody can, it, there's, a, there's a great line, I don't remember, it might have been Feynman said, if you can't, and he's talking about physics, if you can't explain your theory to your bartender, you don't understand it. That's right. Yeah. I think that's true in yeah. philosophy too. It's Anybody who's taught undergraduates knows that. Yes. Anybody, right? I've never understood anything well enough until I've been able to teach it to undergraduates. I, exactly. I think that's deep exactly. wisdom. Exactly. Um, and, I, and I'm not opposed to, okay, there is room for to specialist work. So I've written an entire article, like a 30 page article on three sentences in the sayings of Confucius. Just going through and saying like, here's like five different classical commentaries, here's a grammatical analysis, lexical analysis, right. here's different ways you might interpret this philosophically. Right. That's a specialist piece and there, there's right. room for that. Right. But then, you know, you wanna write books that the average person could pick up and say, yeah. oh, you know what, I, I see what the issue is here. I might not agree with everything in the book, but you know, I see what the topic is. And yeah. so like the second chapter, I, anybody, I wrote it so anybody could pick it up and they could say, yeah, what is, who am I as an individual? I take it for granted I'm a separate person, but gee, that's more problematic than I, than I realized at first. And if I'm not a totally separate person, what political implications does that have? Yeah. You know, yeah. I, I cite the example where uh, Barack Obama infamously said uh, of, you know, people who have a business, he says, well, remember, you didn't build that. Oh, man, and, that killed him. That killed oh, him. People hated that, hated that. But I say, you know, at some level, that's right, because yeah, of none of us is an individual. You know, we are always dependent on other people. Uh, yeah. yeah. And it's, it's funny because, you know, Robinson Crusoe is, I think, a uh, – I mean, people who are at least a little literate think of him as an example of, you know, the can-do spirit where one person by himself can build civilization. But if you actually read Robinson Crusoe – and you have, but it's really about how deeply dependent he is on God and how he needs civilization in the form of all the things he salvages from the shipwreck. Of course. Yeah. Not to mention that he was acculturated within a civilization. I mean, exactly. I mean, I mean yeah. I've had arguments with people, conversations with people about Wittgenstein's argument against private language, and they're imagining it like, well, why can't Robinson Crusoe talk, you know, speak a language? And I'm saying, that's not a right. private language, right? I mean, that's right. a, he exactly. learned a public language, right? Exactly. Um, exactly. Yeah. No, and, and I think, I just want to, so closing on this, I, I, I'm deeply sympathetic um, um, to this aspect of what you're talking about because I think that this resistance to non-Western philosophy, as you're describing it, mm 
you know, let's set aside the issue of the racism question, um, is also part of a more general historical, cultural, aesthetic philistinism among right. contemporary, especially analytic philosophers mm -hmm. that I think is destroying the discipline. I think it is, in other words, I think that part of what you're talking about, it's so important that it literally may be necessary if we're to save the discipline uh, from turning into something that is going to be done in a handful of places and, and maybe not even then after a while. Um, I'm not so sure I think the NYUs and the Princetons are safe in the long term if they yeah. keep going down this road. Yeah. And especially now, I mean, the notion that you'd have to argue for the importance of understanding Asia now is bizarre, right? I mean, it's right. absolutely bizarre. Right? Yeah, I know. <laughs> Given I know. that, you know, the East yeah, is the future. It's the future, yeah. right? I mean, yeah. India and China are still in the process of industrializing. When they're done, that's the future, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, and, and this is, this is why, I mean, I've got a, a, the, in the fourth chapter, I go into why is philosophy so generally important? you know, both for as a vocational training, as the maintenance of democratic institutions, the historical contributions it's made, why I give a kind of sketch of an argument for why I think it could never be replaced by natural science in principle. Um, I cite great scientists like Einstein, who said that, uh, he said what's, uh, a colleague wrote Einstein and said, a physicist said, I'm teaching some philosophy in my physics class and I'm getting some pushback on it. What do you think about it? And Einstein said, I think the study of philosophy is what separates a real seeker of truth from just, you know, uh, uh, just a hack. A technician. Look at Einstein. Yeah, 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 yeah. Can I ask you one last, I know we got a little long, but I have one last question that just occurred to me. Um, how healthy is the state of Asian philosophy in Asia? So, so here's why I'm asking this. Right. Um, two data points. One, historically, um, the Maoists tried very hard to destroy the, the historical legacy to create a kind of a, z, a year zero sort of thing. So that's number one. And number two, my father did extensive business in China, probably for about 20 years. And he said that, that at least the Chinese that he interacted with, not, so that would be in the major cities in the corp, the business, right. he says, were the most mercenary capitalists he'd ever met and have zero interest whatsoever in anything Buddhist, Confucius, or anything else. Right. Mm -hmm. What is the state currently of Asian philosophy in Asia? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, this is something I, I talk about a little bit in the, the third chapter of the book where I talk about the broader political implications and how does philosophy uh, fit into both uh, classic conservative thinkers like uh, Buckley or more recently Matt Lewis, um, who in his book Too Dumb to Fail gives a kind of critique of, uh, he's a conservative critique of the contemporary Republican Party, and, but they kind of advocating a sort of return to traditional Western values and how this is like Xi Jinping calling for a return to traditional Confucian values. And what I found in China is it's, it is complicated because on the one hand, you do have a lot of people who just don't believe in anything except, you know, making money and gaining power. Um, and then you have, though, at the same time, a burgeoning, uh, interest in Christianity, a burgeoning interest in Buddhism, and this return of interest in Confucianism. And the interesting thing to see is going to, is going to be, well, what's going to happen as this moves forward? I think that it's just impossible to have an actual thriving civilization where you don't have some common values besides just making money. It's just not going to work. It won't hold together. And I think Xi Jinping sees that. So his solution is, I'll get people to endorse Confucian values. It'll give them a national identity, but these are also good values that will. Who, serve who is he? Oh, oh, sorry. Xi Jinping is the pr president of China. Right. Okay. Right. He just consolidated his. And he's power. pushing for. So, so, so at the highest levels of government. Yes. This is no longer the Maoist universe anymore. Of, I mean, already wasn't the Maoist universe in a lot of other ways, but in terms of the rejection of the history, right? Cultural history. That's changed. Exactly. And so, uh, and I'm sorry, I should have explained who Xi Jinping was. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm just, yeah, that's why I asked so that the audience would be sure to know. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. so yeah, you're exactly right. Uh, Mao, Mao Zedong, who led the communists to victory in the civil war in 1949, uh, completely rejected Confucianism. Deng Xiaoping, who had led China in a much more moderate direction after the death of Mao, kind of tolerated Confucianism. Xi Jinping, 
who was himself a victim of Mao's cultural revolution when he was young, has specifically endorsed Confucianism and he routinely cites it in his speeches. And I give some examples in the book and I analyze what he says and talk about what he gets right, what he gets wrong. And so, uh, and there's even been like a book published which is available in English about how to read the Chinese classics by Xi Jinping. And so it's a collection of all his sayings. About, I wish our presidents were that literate. Right? <laughs> you know, well, this, just... is, this is another thing. I mean, again, <laughs> another thing I point out in the book is I say, you know, it, it used to be the case that, you know, a Teddy Roosevelt was a Phi Beta Kappa. Uh, George H.W. Bush was Phi Beta Kappa at Yale. Eisenhower was president of Columbia University right. in addition to being a war hero. Right. And Trump well, wasn't, right? <laughs> what's that? I just didn't hear you. I said Trump wasn't. Right? Yeah, exactly. And now, you know, we've had a, uh, a B movie actor as president, a C student, and a D list celebrity. You know, it's just, it's just gone downhill. And we used to have a country run by intellectuals. Right. Or at least people by people who appreciated, that. yeah, at least by people who appreciated to a significant yeah. degree. Yeah. That aspect of life. Um, well, I, I really want to thank you. Um, this this was really interesting. The Aeon piece is great, um, uh, uh, and it's going to get linked to as will the Amazon page for the book or any other page you want. I'm also yeah. going to ask you to send me links. Uh, anything that we talked about today or that we didn't okay. you'd want, there's a link section that people uh, who watch very much appreciate. Um, and um, I'm going to read the book over the Christmas break. And I'll send um, you copy. And uh, no, I'm 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 going to buy a copy. So we need to contribute to your economy, because <laughs> um, um, professors are not rich, and 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 maybe I want to talk to you again um, as great. I get deeper into it. Um, but thank you so much. Oh, thank you. This has been a great conversation. And thanks for doing this. It. And I and I hope to see you soon. Same here. All right. Take care. Bye bye.